A brand new study released this afternoon shows that an estimated seven and a half million people, seven and a half million are misdiagnosed every year at emergency rooms across the United States. I unfortunately know all too well about the cost of misdiagnosis. About a year ago, my then 14 year old daughter, Alice, almost died as a result. And this is not a story I would normally share with a mass audience, but Alice's experience is one that Alice believes can help others because her ordeal was entirely preventable. Last November, 2021, Alice became sick with appendicitis, but the doctors misdiagnosed what she had because her symptoms were not completely standard ones for appendicitis. Ultimately, we learned that while they were treating her for a viral infection, infection instead, her appendix had actually perforated and toxic fluid was seeping out and poisoning her internal organs. Her body started going into what's called hypovolemic shock, meaning her heart was unable to pump enough blood to all of her organs, which causes organ failure. And as my family learned the hard way, this specific appendicitis misdiagnosis it's really not all that uncommon. Appendicitis does not always present a standard way, which means that this specific misdiagnosis happens too often and sometimes to far more tragic results. Alice has recovered, thankfully. She is now stronger and fitter than ever, but this was obviously a horrific trauma, physical and otherwise. Alice and my wife, Jennifer, are now trying to change how doctors rule out appendicitis. We asked CNN's chief medical correspondent, Dr. Sanjay Gupta, to take a look at what Alice went through and how this can be prevented for anyone else. I was so tired. I would sleep through the whole day and my stomach was hurt so bad. I've never been in that amount of extreme pain before. That was the scariest thing I've ever seen because it was just, the life was just leaving her. And I just thought this is, what is wrong? Why is her skin so green? And why are her hands and feet freezing? I mean, you, you really thought that, that Alice might die? I absolutely don't like to think that she could have died, but 100% I was starting to think. I'm okay, Jennifer and my colleague Jake Tapper are 15-year-old Alice's parents. They all wanted to share their story as a cautionary tale and to shed light on how something so common so treatable could go so terribly wrong. I started throwing up on a Saturday morning and I got really sick. I was just not getting better, so my parents took me to go into the hospital. Most likely diagnosis at the time, stomach pains, possible food poisoning, gastroenteritis. Jennifer was particularly worried about appendicitis. I said, this is on Monday, and I said, why don't you just give her a sonogram? Um, you know, she has so much going on down there. She's in so much pain. Let's just see what it is, because we don't know. And they looked at me, and, she, and the doctor said, that data's not needed. That data's not needed. We don't need that data. Data, evidence, and one more critical ingredient, judgment. It's what doctors use to try and make decisions. For example, pain in the right lower belly is considered one of the most common symptoms of appendicitis, and yet, less than half of all people with appendicitis have the classic pattern. Where were you experiencing the pain? I had pain all over my abdomen instead of just um, my right quadrant. The way that they ruled out appendicitis was by a jump test. I was asked to um, jump and I was able to maybe get one inch off the ground and just that ruled out appendicitis for all the doctors. And that's when they just declared it was a viral infection. But being aware of biases is very important. So Dr. Prashant Mahajan heads the Pediatric Emergency Medicine Department at the University of Michigan. He says misdiagnosis can occur in part because of diagnostic momentum. You anchor yourself on that particular diagnosis, and it is possible in some instances that it is taking you away from the condition that the patient has. It was in part that diagnostic momentum that led to the doctors missing the early signs of appendicitis in Alice. Every year, roughly 25,000 children develop appendicitis. And according to this study published in 2020 by Dr. Mahajan, roughly 5% of the time, that's a 1,000 times a year, the story mirrors the story 
of what happened to Alice Tapper next. We went into the hospital and we just assumed the doctors knew what they were talking about. They kind of backed into a diagnosis of a viral infection and Jen and I would say, are you sure it's not appendicitis because her pediatrician thinks it might be? Is there some reason we can't give her antibiotics? Is there some reason we can't get an x-ray or a scan? We see the child every day. So I knew her skin coloring was different. I knew her belly was distended, even though she's a smaller framed child. Those are the things we kept saying. In fact, more than three excruciating days passed in the hospital without much more than pain relievers before the Tapper family was finally able to get some answers. I'm a journalist, so I was able to get the number of the administrator, figure it out. And they, and they took the call and they took action. But most people wouldn't have been able to do that. We recognize we have this privilege. We got an x-ray and it showed that I had something going on in my appendix. So after we got a sonogram, they were like, we need to rush you into surgery after this. But by then, Alice had worsened dramatically. The reason she had suffered such widespread pain was because her appendix had already ruptured, leading to severe infection and sepsis. An appendectomy is one of the most common pediatric operations performed. Typically, it lasts around an hour and the recovery takes a few weeks. In Alice's case, however, the operation couldn't even be done because her abdominal cavity was now filled with infected fluid. I had to get two liposcopic drains at first, and then after they um, discharged me and sent me home, I went back to the hospital because I still wasn't feeling better, and they had to put another liposcopic drain in me. I ended up getting my appendix out 12 weeks later in March. What was your life like during those 12 weeks? I had lost so much weight from being hospitalized that I was just struggling to eat and able to function. I had trouble going to school. I would get so tired and make my mom pick me up early. Months of her life lost. So much of that entirely preventable. You know, I think a lot of people are going to watch this and, and frankly be, be worried. Is there a lesson here, do you think? This isn't a time to be polite when you're in the hospital. You must defend your child and your listening to parents is probably the most important thing doctors and hospitals can do. This could have happened to any child at any hospital in the United States because doctors are not sufficiently aware of how often it is that appendicitis does not present in a standard way. It's been nine months since Alice Tapper finally got her appendectomy. And after a particularly dark time, she is once again allowing herself to start dreaming about the future. But now she has a new mission as well. I want to row in college and maybe study zoology. I just love how my life is turning out. I think that it was a really I wish it never happened to me, obviously, but I think it was a really important learning experience for me. I want other kids to know that they need to advocate for themselves. So Sanjay, uh, you're not only a dad, you're a doctor who works at a major hospital. I can tell you firsthand how frustrating this was for me and Jennifer. So as a parent, when you know something is wrong with your kid, how can you really get your doctor's attention if you feel they're not listening and not taking sufficiently seriously what you're telling them. Yeah. Well, first, Jake, I just I want to say that I'm, I'm sorry. Just I saw all that you all that Alice and all of you you went through. And just as a fellow human, I just want to say I'm sorry that I read those medical records. There was hundreds of pages. It was hard to believe what I was you know, reading that, that sort of nightmare scenario that was unfolding. And I and I just wanted to say I'm so sorry you guys went through that. Look, you know, I learned a lot uh, while looking into this, Jake. I mean, I think one of the things Jennifer said near the end, really being the advocate, understanding that parents know their children better than anyone, and really focusing on what tends to be one of the most common reasons for misdiagnosis, which is if symptoms are atypical at all. It tends to throw off, uh, you know, maybe the, the uh, obvious signs, in this case, of appendicitis. There's a new study that came out today showing there's 130 million ER visits every year, and about five to six percent of the time, there's a misdiagnosis. Two percent of the time, it can lead to adverse side effects, and about 0.3 percent of the time, they can be very serious side effects, even death. So that does happen.
But I think it's this, this eight, you know, so much of medicine is pattern recognition. When there's an atypical symptom, such as what Alice was experiencing, it really threw off that diagnostic momentum.